I'm super excited um, about what God is doing between the Journey Hanley Road uh, and between the gate. And so we want to welcome everybody that's here, our gate family um, and our obviously our family here at the Journey Hanley Road. But I'm excited that our gate family is here with us um, on this first Sunday. And I'm glad that uh, pretty soon uh, it won't even be like a, a special thing on the first Sunday. It's going to be every Sunday. I'm looking. I'm excited about that. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm super um, just excited and uh, looking forward to what God is already doing. God is already working. He's already moving. And I'm excited about not only what this will mean for our two congregations as we come together, um, but I'm even more excited about what it's going to mean for the advancement of the gospel here in New City and here in St. Louis. Uh, I believe this is just a catalytic move uh, for our entire region. I believe that I have not seen and ear have not heard what the Lord has in store for St. Louis. Amen. Amen. Uh, for those who are worshiping with us, perhaps for the first time, my name is Pastor Carlos Smith. I am the lead pastor here at the Journey Hanley Road. Whether you are here in our sanctuary or whether you are tuning in via YouTube Live or Facebook Live, we welcome you. We are so glad uh, that you have chosen to worship with us because we know you passed several churches to get here. Um, whether you came in person or whether you scroll down YouTube uh, to worship with us, you passed a lot of churches. So we know you're not here by mistake. So welcome. And we are glad that you are worshiping with us. Um, I am super excited. So uh, Kyle has been hanging out with us. The gate has been hanging out with us um, on the first Sundays. And I, I, I already told, um, shared with the whole church, I'm like, hey, bro, you a whole preacher, okay? Uh, you, you, you know, it's cool. I, I appreciate your support. You coming, showing up, you know, watching me work on Sundays. But uh, our, um, you know, we need you to kind of get in the ring a little bit, you know, which... He's been super excited and eager to do so. Um, I'm excited today because uh, for the folks at the gate, uh, what you're going to hear is the voice that has been shepherding y'all um, since your church was planted. So it's not going to be a new voice uh, for any of you all. Uh, but for those of us uh, here at the Journey Hanley Road, many of us may have never heard from Pastor Kyle. So I am here to just inform you um, that you are in for a treat. You are about to be blessed. You are going to be edified. You are going to be strengthened. Um, Pastor Kyle, um, as we continue towards our um, our direction, Direction towards becoming one church, which will officially be each, uh, which will be official on Easter Sunday. Pastor Kyle is coming on staff at the Journey Hanley Road as our assistant pastor. So let's give it up for that. So. While this may be your first time hearing from Pastor Kyle, it certainly will not be your last. You're going to hear from him not only via the pulpit, um, but you're also going to be hearing from him as he is going to be, his responsibilities are going to be at large as he oversees um, the, the implementation and the direction and the culture of our church, making sure that our mission, vision, and values flows down to every single ministry of our church. So you're going to hear his voice not only over the pulpit, but you're going to hear it as he speaks into ministry, um, as he helps to set direction and vision over our ministry ministries to make sure um, that we are, are all in step with our mission and vision, and most importantly, in step with the Spirit. So I want to welcome up um, our, what who will soon be our assistant pastor, but currently is the lead pastor of the gate, Pastor Kyle Hubbard. Let's give it up for Kyle. Uh, good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm Pastor Kyle, again, one of the pastors of the Gate Church. I am so excited about being here this morning. Uh, man, want to say good morning to my Hanley Road family and also my Gate family. I see y'all sprinkled out through here. Yeah. And I'm... And I'm so excited about what God is doing by bringing our two churches together. Man, for the glory of our King in University City and beyond. But I have to be honest, I'm a, I'm a little salty. I was a little salty this week uh, because I saw some clips from last Sunday. And I didn't get an invite last Sunday. Uh, and, you know, my mom's here. And, you know, back in her day, she would say that y'all had church last Sunday. I mean, y'all had the old gospel songs. Y'all had the, y'all had the praise dances. I always wanted to be a praise dancer. Y'all had the praise dances. Uh, y'all had the full African garb. I mean, it looked like Wakanda up in here. Like, I mean, <laughs> was y'all greeting each other like this? I was kind of wondering how that worked. But no, uh, 
Listen, I always count it an honor to be in the house of God amongst the people of God, an opportunity to preach the word of God. And so I am going to be continuing on in our Ephesians series. And so I'll be picking up in chapter 1, reading verse 15 down to verse 18. Could you please stand for the reading of God's word? And the word of God says, For this reason, Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Let's pray. Redeemer and Savior, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your word. I pray, dear God, that you speak to us today, that you hide your servant behind the cross, and that you communicate all you will to your people. Use the word. Transform our souls, and we will thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Uh, Church, as I read the book of Ephesians and really all of Paul's writings, I resonate so much with him. I mean, I really, man, I really feel Paul because I'm a type of person who likes and respects people who are all in. Uh, even It doesn't even have to be anything that I'm really involved in. It doesn't even have to be anything I'm, I'm interested in. Like, to give you an example, like being a vegan. I have no interest in being a vegan. However, do, do you, any of you have any vegan friends? I, yeah, I, ha, I have some vegan friends. I have quite a few. But I have this one vegan friend. I would actually call him more like a, a vegan missionary. <laughs> yeah, like he's just out here trying to convert people wherever he goes. I mean, he's trying to save one artery at a time, you know. <laughs> hey, one will lead to two and two will lead to... I'm a church planner, so I get how it works. But... I respect him. I respect all vegans. Why? Because they're so serious about it. They're all in. And, you know, even myself, I'm a person, if people, if people who know me, they will tell you that's just my personality. If I'm involved in something, if I like it, I'm going to go head over heels like I'm all in. I, I like to play basketball. I like to work out. Except I'm not one of those people that can just get out on the road and just run. I'm not that kind of cardio person. I have to play basketball for cardio. So though I'm not an a early morning person, I get up at 5.30 a.m. in the morning, and you'll find me with some guys playing basketball to make sure we get our cardio in. That's my commitment. I'm all in. It would pretty much with any sport I'm all in. Like, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. We got any Dallas Cowboys fans in the building? Yeah, yeah, amen. This, this is how you divide a church very quickly, right? Yeah, I'm all in. Uh, I, love, I love the NBA. I'm a LeBron James fan. Amen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come on, the man is 37 years old, year 19, he scored 56 points last night. I mean, God just knew I was going to be preaching this morning. I just felt like, yeah, amen. Thanks, LeBron, last night. Uh, But I'm all in. I picked up the golf golf bug lately. Uh, That's almost more like an addiction. I mean, I I got the clothes, I got the the clubs, I got my son in golf now, I'm doing the golf trips. I'm all in. I'm fully committed. I'm also all in with personal things like being a husband. Like, I love my wife. My wife is such an amazing and beautifully intelligent person. And I tell my wife all the time, baby, I am all in with you, right? I'm all in with being a father. I love my my two wonderful daughters and my son. I'm all in with being a good father. But I respect those who are all in. So when I read Paul's writings, what I recognize is Paul's passion. What I recognize is his engagement. I recognize his devotion. And what I really recognize is the unwavering commitment of a man who has made a decision to be all in on Jesus. Is anybody here all in on Jesus this morning? And like, like Paul, I, I'm telling you, I love the Lord. I love the gospel. I love the scriptures. I love the church. I love sheep. That's probably why I'm a pastor. I love being with the sheep. And listen, I don't know where you are this morning. But if you don't get anything else from my sermon, please receive this. 
Listen, there is no better place to be. There is nothing worth more of your time than to be all in on Christ. Why? Well, the Bible actually says if you put your faith in him, Jesus is all in on you. Actually, he was all in on you before you ever made a confession of faith. Yeah, there's no greater place to be. So in our text, what we see is that Paul is encouraging the Ephesian church in their commitment to Christ. And he does it in three ways. He says, first, I want you to know who you are in Christ. Secondly, he says, I want you to know who this God is that you serve. And then third, he says that I want you to know what the Lord has called you to do. And so let's deal with the first one, who you are. Let's look at Ephesians verse 15. Paul starts out by using three words. He says, for this reason. Now, when you see statements like this, what is happening is that the person speaking is identifying that they had a response to a prior initial action. And so he goes on to say, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in our, my prayers. See, what Paul is telling them is that Ephesian church, listen, there's something that you have done that is stirring me up on the inside. Yeah, there's something that I've heard about you and that I've witnessed about you that is causing me to lift my hands and to worship the Lord for you. And then he also says there's something that you have done that is causing me to fall to my knees and to cry out and to pray and to advocate for you. And he points to the reason. He says, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. See, what Paul is doing here is what we call at the Gate Church a time of affirmation. Yeah, see, at the Gate Church, uh, every community group and really every ministry meeting at the end, we, we have like, we set aside about five minutes before we pray to have affirmation time. Now, let me explain what that is. Affirmation time is basically where we open up the floor to allow anyone to affirm something that they have seen or heard or experienced by someone else in the room. Yeah, and so, I mean, like, even this week, we had uh, one of our first leadership meetings here at the church, and so, uh, man, your leaders and our leaders were huddled around the scriptures, and we were reading, and we were giving our observations on the text, and, and at the end, we were talking about affirmations, and so at the end, one of my leaders affirmed Sister Sarah um, for all the work that she has been putting in behind the scenes to create uh, the Vacation Bible School for this summer, right, for our kids and for the youth and for the community, Amen. <laughs> And from the response that I saw in her, it seemed like that she was encouraged. In our community groups, we do affirmation time. And I mean, affirmations could be simply uh, one of our singles who see some parents and one of the kids come in the room and they might be doing something. They send them out. And, and a- after community group is over, we will have affirmation time. And that single person might reach out and say, listen, you know what? Um, the way that you were so graceful with your child. You weren't harsh with them in your correction. You loved them. You showed them mercy, and you redirected them, and you sent them out. Man, I always, man, I want to be a parent like that when I get there. And for a parent, I'm just being, now listen, I've never gotten that affirmation. But I'm sure as a parent, that has to be encouraging, right? Sometimes affirmation time is simply just that you showed up and were present. Yeah, because everybody in the group might know that you're going through a hard time and that you're having a difficult season in life and everything in you is telling you just stay at home and isolate, right? We've all been there, but no, you got up out your bed and you just showed up. And so the people in the group just want to affirm and say, thank you for coming. Let me forewarn you. Affirmation time typically is supposed to be five minutes, but it turns into 20-minute cross sessions real quick. Yeah, and what's so beautiful about it is one affirmation tends to lead to another, and another affirmation leads to it, and it becomes this ping-pong effect of, of Christians sitting in a room affirming, affirming one another. But why is that? Why is it such a success? Why does it bless so many people's hearts? Well, can we be honest this morning? I'm going to say it again. Can we be honest this morning? Yes. yes. Well, let's be honest. Even though we're Christians, we don't all typically view ourselves in the most positive way. Yeah. Even though we're saved, even though we're blood-bought believers, we don't always view ourselves in the most positive light. 
See, we're good in church with telling Christians and hammering Christians about their propensity to sin and their tendency to fall. We're good in church, which is edifying and beautiful. We're good at accountability. We're good at church discipline. What I've learned is that in church, there's nothing wrong with this, but we're good at identifying mistakes. But my question this morning is, is are we good at affirming righteousness? Yeah. Are we good at affirming faithfulness to Jesus? See, what I see in the text is that Paul is an expert in the field of affirmation. And not only does he model it for us, but the Bible communicates that we should be proficient at it as well. See, Hebrews 10 says this, Church, spur one another on unto good works. What God is saying there is that, that I, you have a part to play in helping the believer run harder for me. You have a part to play by just your words and encouragement to have another believer uh, be more committed and more devoted. You don't know who was going to give up yesterday, but you encourage them and so they run harder today. This works even in sports. I've been going to the district championships all this week uh, for high school basketball. And what I noticed as I was preaching this sermon, working on this sermon, was like, this works in, in sports. Like, this is why you have cheerleaders. This is why you have home team advantage. Because those on the outside are cheering for you when you make the basket. And what does it do? It causes you to want to run down the court and play harder and harder. Hear me, church family. Those of us who are in Christ. We should not view ourselves through our mistakes. We should not view ourselves through our failures. That is not where our identity lies. See, see, this is the beauty of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Romans 8.1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ. Listen, I don't know where you are today, but if you've been struggling this week, if you've been down on yourself about a bad decision that you've made, or maybe you live in a constant state of calling yourself names, because we can do that. If you call yourself, like like the movie, uh, uh, Life Can't Get Right, remember that? Yeah, if if that's the way you feel about yourself, hear me, beloved, your identity is in Jesus. And let me let you know what Jesus says about you. 1 Peter 2, 9, this is what the Lord says. He says that you are a chosen race. You you are a royal priesthood. He says that you are a holy nation. Don't let that go over your head. See, your God does not view you through your sin. Your God views you through the righteousness of Christ. So he says that you are a holy nation. You are a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. And I love the fact that this is written to the church. Why? Because God knew that we needed to hear it. See, Paul in our text, he's not using flattery. No, this is simply based on what he had seen and what he had heard. And this is actually the spirit that our merger was birthed out of. See, in our first meeting, see, this is not new, this whole merger conversation. This started out two and a half years ago. Uh, we had a meeting. It was me, Los, it was uh, 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 Sabrine, it was Curtis, and we were in that meeting thanking the Lord for what we had both seen and heard about one another. And we weren't just in there affirming each other's leadership. I mean, I did affirm Carlos was preaching. I did. I did that, Right. Right, but we weren't in there just affirming each other's leadership. We spent most of our time speaking about you. Yeah, about you as our individual members. Yeah, we talked about how both of our churches over the years had been through some tough times. Yeah, we discussed how our churches had dealt with heartache and disappointment, how us being in St. Louis, we've dealt with the toxic political landscape and racial division in our city. And instead of uh, allowing that to split the church or make us give up, what we were affirming was that both of our churches remain steadfast to Christ, loving one another, putting our faith in Jesus and his gospel. That was the catalyst for our union. Two churches who were all in on Christ in the same community called to the same mission. Which actually leads me to my next point. Paul says, I want you to know who you are in Christ, but I also want you to know this God, who this God is that you serve. 
Verse 16 and 17 says this. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, church, notice that Paul does not pray that the Ephesian church has great health. Yeah, he doesn't pray that they get blessed with a, new, with a five-digit tax return, like so many of you all are praying right now. <laughs> Leave Jesus alone about that tax return. <laughs> well, unless you're praying for mine, you could do that. You could do that. You have my permission. Uh, <laughs> Paul does not pray that they receive a new condo or new clothes or the new Tesla truck, even though it's a nice truck. Paul doesn't even pray for things like you would think he would pray for. He doesn't even pray for a new church building so that they can do ministry in. No, what we see is that Paul prays for the only thing that they truly need. He says, I'm praying that you receive wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. <laughs> A spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. See, what Paul is praying for, you can't find this on Amazon. <laughs> Even though Amazon got everything. I mean, you can get a golf club, some Pampers and Doritos on Amazon. They have everything. But they don't have this. I know they don't have this because I typed it in and checked just to make sure. And they didn't have it. They gave me a lot of suggestions of things, I, if I'm into this, that I could buy. But they don't have this. See, what Paul is praying for, they don't stock this at the grocery store. They don't, this ain't something that you can pick up at the mall. No, Paul says there's only one place that carries this. He says you must go to Jesus' Father. <laughs> yeah, he says you must go to the Father of glory, and what he will do is that he will give you the Holy Spirit whose nature is wisdom and whose job is revelation. But I want to bring your attention to something because you might miss this in the text. What Paul is actually doing is he is pointing to the supernatural unity and collaboration within the Trinity. Yeah, look back at the text. What Paul is pointing to is the supernatural unity and collaboration within the Trinity. He's talking about the Godhead here. I just preached about this a couple weeks ago. The Godhead, the Trinity, the, where there's no division, no jealousy. No competing, trying to take over one another's position. See, what Paul was saying to them is that you have the fullness of God working together to provide all that you need. The word wisdom here is the Greek word Sophia. Let me give you the definition. It means having the capacity to understand God's will and also the ability to act in accordance to God's will. I'm going to say that again. The word wisdom here means having the capacity to understand God's will while also having the ability to act in accordance with God's will. But here's the problem. God's will can only be spiritually discerned. That's why we need the Holy Spirit of God working in our lives. Because the Bible says things like, love your enemies. Now to the natural mind, that sounds like, let me, let me put you out to the test, gate people, what does that sound like? One, two, three. Sounds like foolishness to the natural mind. That's right. <laughs> Obviously, I preach a lot of things that have foolishness in it, right? <laughs> uh, to the natural mind, that sounds like nonsense. The Bible actually says, and I don't know if you've ever read this, the Bible actually says if somebody walks up to you and slaps you, that you are supposed to turn the other cheek. I don't know if you've ever read that. I've heard that before in church before. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. To the natural mind, that sounds like insanity, right? Somebody slapped me, I just, yeah, turned the other cheek. Matter of fact, I have a, a rapper, one of my favorite rappers, his name is Tobe Nigwe. And he devoted a whole song to this. Yeah, he said, listen, he said the only thing in the Bible from Genesis to Revelations, I mean, you got predestination, you got limited atonement, you got regeneration, you got justification. He said the only thing that I have an issue with that don't sit right with me is you smack me and I turned the other cheek. And so he has a song. He says, try Jesus. Don't try me. Because I still fight, right? He says that. He's just saying, I'm not there yet. The Holy Spirit is still doing a work. Here, the Bible says things like, love those who hate you. Yeah, pray for those who persecute you. All things the natural mind rejects. 
And so this is why we need the Holy Spirit so he can transform our thinking. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says this, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And I love this text. It's one of the most humbling texts in all the Bible. Philippians 1, 13 says, it is God who works in you both to will and to do or to act according to his good pleasure. He's literally saying that it's me who's giving you the idea to open the door and to give uh, uh, contributions to people, to love people. Like It is God who's working in you both to will and to act, to do according to his good pleasure. Church, Paul is simply saying that if you have God, you have everything that you need. Yeah, that you, listen, that, that, that it is really God who does it all. See, it is God who reveals his son to, me, to us. Listen, I, I don't know your theological where you sit, but please understand this. The Bible says it is God who reveals his son to us. Yes, he, he's the one who convicts us of our sin. He is the one who gives us faith to believe in the gospel. He's the one that regenerates our hearts. He's the one who takes us from death unto life. He is the one who sanctifies us. He's the one who gives us spiritual gifts. He's the one who changes our worldview. He's the one who empowers us to obey him, to serve him, and to fulfill his mission in the world. It's him. And so the one who does all that, that's the God that we serve. <laughs> And so it's not hard for me to go all in on Christ. And it shouldn't be hard for the church to go all in with Jesus either. It shouldn't be hard for us as the church to raise our hands sometimes. It shouldn't be hard for us to sing praises to our Lord. It shouldn't be hard for us to take our little issues that seem big to us and lay them before a majestic God. It shouldn't be hard for us to put down our differences and stop arguing and and being bitter and, and having all these issues. We need to keep Christ at the center. Beloved, this is the goal of our churches coming together, that we may increase and see the glory and majesty and dominion of an omnipresent, all-knowing, omnipotent, loving God. Us coming together, spurring one another on unto good works, carrying out the mission that he has called us to. And let me say this, revelation in the knowledge of God, it is not a one time decision. Revelation in the knowledge of God is not what you did, just what you did when you first got saved. No, no. Revelation in the knowledge of God is a day by day, minute by minute work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It is the Lord working until we see him in glory. This is God in our sanctification, which leads me to my last point. We need to know what God has called us to do. Look at verse 18. It says this, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Church, did you know that you were called to hope? The text literally says it. It says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So you're called to hope in two ways. You're called to experience hope, and you're also called to share hope. You see, before Christ, we were all hopeless. Yeah, we were all bound. We were slaves to our sin. And no amount of money could save us. No person could make us whole. There was nothing that we could do to make ourselves right with God. No, Romans 3.23 is true. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But let me explain what all means, because I know there could be some confusion about all. That means no matter your educational pedigree, yeah, no matter your socioeconomic status, no matter your philanthropic contributions, no matter your zip code, your bank account, your color, your race, your political party, all means all. Everyone has sin. No exemptions, no exceptions. All have fallen short. And then Romans 6 says, and the wages or payment for that sin is death and judgment. God says none of us are innocent. (laughs) 
My kids understand this theological concept of none of us are innocent. Not because their father has done a good job catechizing them. It's really just because when one of them gets in trouble, they're very good at making sure that I know that their other siblings are guilty of crimes too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, when one of them get in trouble, they always give me a list of all the heinous things that their brother or sister has gotten away with, right, against their father and their mother. And church, here's the only difference between us and them is that our father don't need anyone to tell us what we've done. He sees it all. <laughs> And there's no amount of apologies, there's no amount of penance that can atone for our sin against our king. We're all guilty as charged. And I know that sounds hopeless. But beloved, what I'm here to tell you this morning is thanks be to God that that is not the end of the story. Somebody here needs to hear that. Thanks be to God that that is not the end of the story. Because one day hope stepped in. Yet yeah, one day, hope left heavenly places. Yet yeah, one day, hope wrapped himself in human flesh. Hope was born of a virgin. Hope was born in a, a manure-ridden manger. And one afternoon after hope got up, he, he came to the water to be baptized. And John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hope woke up every day and lived perfectly before the Father, fulfilling all righteousness required of us. Hope was arrested. Hope was abandoned and betrayed by his friends. Hope was whipped and beat. He was nailed to a cross. Hope bled and hope died, paying for our sin debt, not his. He was innocent. He wasn't supposed to die. He shouldn't have had to die, but he wanted to save us. And they took his dead, lifeless body and they wrapped hope. <laughs> they wrapped hope in a shroud, and they laid him in a tomb. Can you imagine thinking the one who's come to save you, you see him dead, and you, he's hope. <laughs> I'm wrapping him in a shroud, and I'm laying his dead, lifeless body in a tomb. What am I to do now? But three days later, <laughs> hope got up. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. See, on Easter Sunday, on Easter Sunday, we're going to come together and we're going to celebrate a union. But for real, what we're going to come here Easter Sunday and, and, and represent and, and celebrate is the fact that hope got up. With all power in his hands, defeating sin and defeating death and declaring for all eternity that if anyone would put their trust and hope in him, their sins would be washed clean. They would be covered in his blood, yet white as snow. I don't know how that works. And you will experience mercy. Hear me. God says you will experience grace. You will experience compassion and love. I don't know who needs to hear this, but hope says that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. Hope says that he will be your protection, that he will be your strength when you are weak, and that he will carry you through your storm, your adversity, your situation. And what's so beautiful is when we leave here, hope says, I will welcome you into eternity to live in a blessed shalom. Church, this is the inheritance that Paul was speaking of. He wasn't talking about money or insurance policies. He was talking about this, the gospel. <laughs> and this is the hope that we get to share with the world. Do you know that? Of all messages to be able to be tasked to share with the world. I'm in sales. I, I, I communicate and sell people a whole lot of things. But this is no sales pitch. This is truth that the living God gave his life for you. Beloved, hope is who brought our two churches together. I believe that. And so I pray that it will be the hope of Christ that leads us in this new season. As we become a light in the city for the glory of our King, because our churches have made a decision to obey Christ, to come together, and to be all in on his blessed name. Amen. Stand to your feet. Let's pray. <laughs> Wonderful Savior, thank you for your word. God, thank you for loving us enough to coming into your own creation for broken sinners, people who had rejected you, but you saw fit to love us anyhow. I pray, dear Lord, that something that was communicated today that it encourages, that you will use it in our sanctification, 
There may be someone out there that doesn't know you, Lord God, that they will come to faith today. You tell us if we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and that he was raised from the dead, that we will be saved. And so anyone under the sound of my voice, if you do not know Christ, all you have to do is trust him. Cry out to him. Ask him to be your Lord, be your Savior. Turn from your sin and turn to the arms of Jesus. Grant us grace. Give us wisdom as we walk out this merger. God, you are good. You mean this for our good. And so we will trust you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.